Hello booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Bookies and Books. This video is my wrap-up for People April. That's the readathon that I hosted with Roz from Scally Danling about the books. It was the first edition of this readathon and I very much hope there will be a second edition. If I'm here next year, there will be one because you responded so wonderfully to this invitation that we gave you. Uh, we invited you to read nonfiction about people, so biographies, autobiographies, memoirs, letters, diaries, and things like that. And so many of you incorporated one of these books in your reading this month. It was wonderful to see. Uh, unfortunately for me, I did not have the best month in April. Uh, the first week, I was extremely busy with obligations that I had not foreseen when I announced my uh, readathon. In, in March, I had not foreseen that the first week of April would be busy with um, obligations that would prevent me from reading and from watching booktube too. Uh, so that was the first week. And then the second week, I got back in the groove a little bit. And then in the third week, I caught COVID. <laughs> and for five days, I could I couldn't do anything. Uh, the, the first thing that shuts down in COVID is your nose, and the second thing is your brain. Um, <laughs> and then I. I couldn't think, I couldn't do anything. So for five days, uh, I just was a, um, a slug on the sofa and in the bed and I couldn't do anything. And then by the third week, uh, by the fourth week, uh, slowly, gradually, I sort of gained back my energy and continued reading and watching videos and things like that. But the net result is that I did not read a lot and I did not watch all the videos, unfortunately, uh, of people who participated in People April, of people who tagged me to, to tell me that, hey, I'm participating. Uh, I, I watched as many as I could. If I missed some, I'm very, very sorry. Uh, next year, hopefully, April will be better for me. Hope, Hopefully, April will be kinder with me next year and I will have more time uh, to be a, a good host. But I think for a first year, it went super well. Uh, I, thank you everyone for participating. Uh, many of you combined the readathon People April with other readathons, such as Trans Girl Readathon or Picture This Readathon. And I, I think that's great. I think it's wonderful. Uh, the, the, the more people participate in many readathons, the, the better booktube is. So um, th that's my general words of introduction for this wrap up is to thank you everyone for participating and to tell you that next year we'll be back, hopefully. Um, we, we, I don't like to predict the future because who knows what's going to happen in 12 months. Did anyone at the beginning of 2020 predict the COVID pandemic? Perhaps some people in China, but in North America, we did not see it coming. So who knows what can happen in 12 months, but hopefully we'll be back next year. Um, so the rest of this video, I want to talk about the group read, so because we had a group read, and then I want to talk about my personal project, because I said that I would read a bunch of memoirs and try to figure out what it is that I like in memoirs and what it is that I don't like. So uh, I did not read a bunch of memoirs, as I said, I was, uh, my month of April was not very good, uh, but I started in March, so that, may, that means I managed to read a few. So we'll start with the group read. So our group read was uh, the, the five, the untold story story of the women killed by Jack the Ripper by Hallie Rubenholt. Um, so there was a Voxer group and uh, Roz, uh, I'm going to leave a link to her video in the description in the description box. I don't know how to pronounce these words. Description box. Um, Roz made a wonderful wrap up, a wonderful sum up of our conversation on Voxer. Uh, so I invite you to, to go there. If you did read the book but did not join the Voxer group, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting, I think, video. Uh, so uh, in this case, I'm not going to talk about other people's impression of the book. I'm just going to talk about my impressions of the book. Um, I really loved reading this book. Uh, the first thing that surprised me was a sentence in the introduction. Um, like a lot of people, I know about Jack the Ripper and vaguely I know that he's a man, a serial killer, who killed five women and I assume these women were prostitutes. And right from the start in the introduction, the author tells us it's not true. That was the theory of the police at the time and they were so focused on it that they failed to see the obvious, which was that Jack the Ripper killed women while they slept. And that made so much sense suddenly. It explains why the women never screamed, why they never fought back. It explains why he was so quiet. If the woman was sleeping, you just slash her throat and that's it, it's the end. Um, there were no defensive wounds as far as I know. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense. And as the author says, for 
three of the five women, there's not a shred of evidence that they ever worked at any point in their lives as prostitutes. So why would suddenly they would be prostitutes on the last night of their lives? It makes no sense. So uh, already it, it was something that uh, I was already impressed at the beginning um, to see the depth of the research because the author went back to the sources. Uh, for most of the cases, unfortunately, the file of the police went missing at some point so we she she could only work with what was left so in two cases she still had the police file uh, but in the other cases you have to work with newspaper articles and then again um, how, how much that there's quite a bit of contradictory information because perhaps the reporters did not have the primary information perhaps because they wanted to sell copies and invented a few things um, because depending on the person you talk to uh, so, some people said oh yes I knew her very well but in fact they didn't really know her or things like that so she had to sift through a lot of contradictory information but she managed to get the most out of the little that she had and she completed the rest by painting the picture of the the how what's the word that I'm looking for I just have the word context in me in, in me in my head um that that's not what I want it's not context the, the surrounding so painting the the portrait de depicting the the London in which these women lived uh, and depicting their situation. Uh, so there's a, a lot of descriptions of the living conditions. And of course, I knew that a poor people in the Victorian era lived in very precarious living conditions and all of that. But the, the picture that she paints makes it very vivid. And one thing that struck me is that uh, she said that very often, Complete families lived in rooms that were eight feet by eight feet. Okay, the phone, the, where the camera is, that's on the windowsill, so that's one wall. You see the corner there? That's another wall. That's 10 feet. That's the distance. So imagine a room like this square and five, six, eight people living in this. That's my reading room. That's not even big enough for a bedroom. No, it's a big enough for a bedroom. I know I live in North America and we have ideas of space that are perhaps a bit uh, exaggerated compared to other places in the world. But try to fit an entire family and they have to cook in here, sleep in here, eat, uh, change, wash, the, oh, wash their clothing. Can you wash your clothing in here? Anyway, you had to do all of this and you had to go to the bathroom. You, well, it wasn't really a bathroom, it was a bucket, really. Um, and you had to do that in front of everyone in the middle in these cramped conditions. And that, 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 was, that made the situation very vivid, very realistic. Um, she also talked about uh, infantile mortality because um, in particular it affected one of the victims of Jack the Ripper. One of the reasons why um, this woman ended up in Whitechapel was because she lost all her children. Her children just died one after the other after the other and and that must be heartbreaking. Um, and it's not because it happens often that it's less sad, it, it's just heartbreaking and that's enough to destroy a soul of anyone. Um, and uh, the other thing is that pretty much all of these women had alcohol issues. Um, they all ended up being separated from the husbands, uh, the ones who were married, because not all of them were married. Um, that's another thing that she talks about, the relationships between men and women. We tend to think of Victorians as very, um, very clear about their morals, uh, no sex outside of marriage and all of that. However, that was more for the middle and upper classes and the lower classes. Uh, like they said, if somebody tells you they're married, they're married and nobody asks any questions. And the social situation made it almost mandatory for women to find a man, a protector, uh, somebody who would bring some income because of course women could not really work a lot. And if they did work, they were paid less than men for the exact same job. So it was better for women to find a man. And if you were married and separated from your husband, in theory, you could not get married again so you just basically hooked up with someone else and started living with that man and then you presented him at your husband because that that was the way you talked about uh, your your spouse your partner so um a lot of things about victorian societies a lot of realities a lot of um uh, uh, 
yeah, a lot of situation in Victorian society that I was not necessarily aware of. I read a bit of Victorian literature, but uh, when writers of the 19th century wrote novels, they wrote for a 19th century public. So th there were some things they did not need to say. They did not need to explain anything because the people there just knew perfectly well uh, if they were saying that this person, this character lived uh, in... Um, in, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, a workhouse. Well, they knew exactly what a workhouse was. Uh, for us in the 20th, 21st century now, uh, it's, it's much more difficult to know what that is. Um, so uh, Ruben Holt also did a, talks about workhouses and um, the very precarious living of uh, people who had no savings. And it was extremely hard to have any savings. Uh, you could not really open a bank account just like this. Um, and yeah, if you lost your job, if you broke your leg, if you if you got sick, you got, I don't know, COVID <laughs> before COVID existed and could not work for a few weeks, that's it. You would lose the place where you lived. You would lose, you would lose everything. So, um, yes, it, it was extremely moving. Not, not an easy read. It's not an easy read because all of these women, they lived in very, in very precarious situations. Um, and, and the other thing that struck me is that the five women, in a way, they all had different backgrounds. Uh, some of them were educated. One of them came from Sweden. I did not know that. She was a an immigrant from Sweden. Uh, she was from the countryside in Sweden and then she went to work as a maid in a town and then unfortunately she got pregnant. Um, I say unfortunately because it was outside of marriage and Sweden was at least as rigid as Victorian Britain about these things if not more. Um, and then she had to work as a prostitute uh, and then she found a, a family who accepted to give her a job as a maid sort of a, to give her a second chance and she ended up moving to London and that was a fascinating journey. Uh, one of of the victims was actually a professional prostitute. She actually earned her living like this. And surprisingly enough, she's the only one who died in her own bed because the other four, they were living on the street that particular night. Uh, they had no place to, to sleep, so they were sleeping rough. But the last one, uh, Mary Jane, she had a place to stay and it was because she worked as a prostitute. So it's a bit... Um, it's it's a bit um, <laughs> uh, it's a bit jarring that the, it, when you look at it that the, the morals of Victorian society they were upside down in a way uh, because they very much believed that if you worked honestly if you worked hard you would be um, you would be récompensé darn I hate it when I cannot find the words in English um, you would get what you deserve and you would get a good life. And if you lived uh, with bad morals and things like that, you would get a horrible life. But in the case of these five women, the one who lived as a prostitute was actually the one who lived uh, in the most luxury, who had who had a place to stay in that particular case. And before that, she used to be sort of an upper class prostitute, like, um, um, oh, what's the name again? Um, Demi Mondaine in French. Uh, so, so she would basically be the mistress of some rich man and she would get uh, a room paid and she would get pretty frocks and things like that. And then bad luck happened and she ended up being a prostitute for the lower classes and that's, that, that, that's not, um, that, that wasn't pretty. But uh, at least she had a place where to sleep, but sh she died in her old bed anyway, but she, she was murdered anyway. But uh, anyway, uh, all of this to say that uh, this book was very interesting. It, it was, I've heard of it a lot on Booktube because a lot of people had read it, but with reason, it, it was really excellent. So I would recommend that wholeheartedly. Um, okay, so now, my personal project. If you've been watching this channel for a little while, you've heard me say that I don't like memoirs. But at the same time, you will have seen me read memoirs, and not just because of the Booktube Prize, not just because I had to, because I want to. And I wanted to use the month of April to solve a little bit this contradiction in, my, in what I'm saying and in what I'm doing. I'm saying I don't like memoirs, and yet I read memoirs. But it's true that there are tons of memoirs that I don't like. So my initial project was to read a ton of them, to read like, like ten, eight, ten of them, and then try to figure out really what is it that I like and what is it that I don't like. Uh, but for the reason that I mentioned earlier, I was not able to read as many as I wanted to. I ended up reading just four. So the four that I read, the first one was Don't Think, Veer by Alice Robb. So this is a 2023 release, and it is about uh, this journalist who 
who used to be a ballerina, not a professional ballerina. She never made it to the professionals, but she was in the American School of Ballet for um, three or four years. And this work ethic, this dream of becoming a ballerina, this identity that she built as a teenager, as someone who does ballet, as someone who is a ballerina, stayed with her. And she wanted to explore how this experience stays with you, what sort of effect ballet has on a person, um, the mentality, and uh, how to let go of it, and things like that. So she went back and she looked at the pictures of her class. Uh, there were 12 girls, if I remember correctly, in her class, only one of them made it to a to be a professional dancer. All the others were let go at some point by the School of Ballet, which is which is something that they do, particularly for the girls. Uh, the boys, because they are there are few in number who want to become ballet dancers. They have more chances of becoming professionals. But for the girls, they, 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 will, they will accept a dozen girls every year, knowing perfectly well that only one or two will end up working as ballerinas or dancers in general. Um, so it's a very cruel world. And it is not just a memoir, because she's not just talking about her experience, she also does a lot of research. Um, she read a bunch of books, the memoirs of other ballerinas, she interviewed former ballerinas, uh, or her classmates, and she interviewed people to, to know um, what their experiences were. So this is part memoir, part journalistic investigation, uh, which I think makes the book much more interesting, because if it was just her experience as a failed ballerina, I don't think it would have been interesting. Um, whether you like ballet or not, I don't think it would have been interesting. The next book that I read was Wave by Sonali Deraniyagala. So uh, this author is originally from Sri Lanka, but she had been living in the United Kingdom for a while. She had been married to a man there. They had two children. In 2004, Christmas 2004, they were back in her native Sri Lanka. They were on holiday there. They were sleep spending the night in a national park. Uh, so they were in a hotel near the, um, near the ocean, uh, in the jungle, I guess. Uh, her parents were with her and uh, they saw this wave coming and it was the, the famous tsunami that killed so many people. And this woman lost her husband her two sons, so her two children, and her parents. She was the only survivor of all this family. And she talks about the events of that day, and she talks about the aftermath, because as you can guess, she went in a profound depression after that. And it took years and years and years to come out of it. And even at, at, as, the writing, as of the writing of the book, which is not that long ago, um, she was not still not completely out of it. How do you survive losing your entire family? So the book was very short, uh, very sober. Uh, it, it's um, it's sad. It's extremely sad, but at the same time, it's not meant to make you cry. Um, and I, it, that's all I'm going to say for the moment. I'll analyze what the what I liked and what I didn't like later. Third book that I read: Garlic and Sapphire, The Secret Life of a Restaurant Critic in Disguise by Ruth Reichel. Uh, so, this is the memoir of a restaurant critic. Uh, she was working for the New York Times in the 1990s, and the critic of the New York Times, it, it's a person who is well known in restaurants, they are expecting her. So she decided to disguise herself to be able to experience the restaurants just like anyone else would experience it, uh, so that the chefs wouldn't really know that it was her and would not make anything special of it. And she, she talks about the various characters that she impersonated and the, uh, the, the restaurants that she, where she went. Not all of them, of course, but a few, the few more memorable experiences. And it makes for very entertaining reading. Uh, so her disguises, they are quite clever, they are funny. Um, the way she writes makes, makes the characters that she creates rather, re rather realistic, rather well made. They, they, she, she makes them come alive. And the food descriptions, the food. I'm not a foodie, but oh my God, I wanted to eat everything that she talked about. Everything just sounded so good. That, that was the best part of the book. It was the descriptions of the food. And I guess I understand why. That, that's her day job, to write about food. And she has a lot of practice in that. And she's good at it. So it, that was very entertaining. And the last one that I read was Touching My Father's Soul, 
a Sherpa's journey to the top of the Everest by Jamling, Tenzing, Norgay and Broughton Colbert. Uh, so I assume that Broughton Colbert is uh, somewhat of a ghost writer, uh, though there isn't a lot of ghosting if your name is on the cover. Uh, so uh, Jamling, Tenzing, Norgay is a Sherpa. Uh, so, uh, in case you don't know, Sherpa does not just mean guide, it does not mean porter, it's actually a people living in Nepal. They were originally from Tibet and they left in the 17th or 16th century, something like that, and they moved to uh, Nepal and they have been living there ever since. So, as a group, as an ethnicity, uh, they live basically at the foot of, the Mount, of Mount Everest and other mountains. And because they have been living there for generations, they are much more used to high altitudes than anyone else on the planet, basically. And by tradition, whenever uh, any European expedition wanted to try to go to the top of the Everest, they would need a lot of porters and a lot of, uh, of guides, and they would hire people from the Sherpa nation. So uh, that, that is why Sherpa has now become synonymous with guide or mounted guide. Um, in fact, it's a, it's a nation, a bit like a Mohawk is not just a haircut and Cherokee is not just an SUV. These are people. So uh, that, that's what Sherpa means. So he's a Sherpa. Uh, ethnically, culturally, but he was born in India because his father was one of the first men to reach the top of the Everest with Edmund Hillary. They, they were a team of two and they got there together at the top. And of course, the Western world never took note of the name of the Sherpa in question. They just talked about Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man on top of the Everest and all of that, when in fact they did it together and they were a team. For, for, um, there was an entire expedition and uh, at the end there was only two people who could go together try for, from the last camp on top, because there are several camps like at different levels of the mountain. Nowadays, it's done in four camps. At the time, it was done in nine. And there was only two people at a time who left from camp number nine to the top, trying to get to the top. And the team of Edmund Hillary and of um, uh, Norgay, uh, I, I forgot his first name, uh, were the third team trying it on that expedition. And they were the first one to succeed. Uh, so, so that's all things that I learned in this memoir. Uh, but Norgay, uh, this one, <laughs> is also uh, a mountain climber. Uh, and he was there in 1996 when there was uh, a tragic day where so many people died trying to climb the Everest. If you've read Into Thin Air by John Krakauer, um, that, that is the same expedition. And that was his first time attempting to climb the Everest. Uh, so he talks about that. He talks about climbing mountains. Um, his father did not agree at the time in 1996. His father was dead. He died in the 1980s. But he had said, I climb Mount Everest so that you wouldn't have to, uh, so that I could give you financial security. And of course, they had financial security thanks to that exploit their father did because uh, there were four children and uh, all of them ended up studying in the United I don't know if they all studied in the United States, but he did study in the United States and most of them lived in the United States or in India, and they had very comfortable lives compared to other Sherpas who were living, uh, were still living at the foot of Mount Everest and the other mountains of the Himalayas. Um, so uh, yeah, this is about the journey on top of the Everest, but also this a spiritual journey, uh, because Norgai, having spent a lot of time in the United States, sort of lost the connection with traditional religion and all of that. And when he went back to live in India um, and attempted to climb Mount Everest, uh, he sort of rediscovered his faith. Um, he sort of understood better what his parents, his mother in particular, believed in and uh, the Buddhist faith and all of that. So uh, there's also a personal journey in this book. It's not just an adventure going on top of the Everest, there's also a personal journey. And I really enjoyed this book. This one is told a bit more in an oral manner. It's kind of, it's kind of obvious. It is obvious um, that uh, Norgai told his memories to someone, and that person wrote them down. Probably improved it a little bit, but it is. You can hear the voice. You can hear that it's not something that was thought in the written form. It was thought in the spoken form. It's it's obvious from the text. Um, so anyway, so that's the four memoirs that I read. Um, so th that's not a lot to make a big analysis, but I've read other memoirs before and I kind of, 
I know, I figured out what it is that makes me like a memoir or not. And the conclusion is that I like memoirs that are where the person writing the memoir is a witness of something else. That they are not just talking about their own lives, the, their own experiences, they are witnesses of themselves. That I don't like. I want memoirs that are about something outside the person. So I want memoirs about the person looking out, not looking in. Those I don't like. And of these four that I read, there was one that was like this, and that was Wave. Um, it's kind of harsh to criticize that. But th throughout the book, I, well, not throughout, at the beginning, I was really caught up. That's the, I almost, it's a very short memoir. Um, but the first half, approximately, is the day in the immediate aftermath of the tsunami. And I was very much caught up in her experience because at that point, she was telling us what happened. She was a witness to this massive event that was the tsunami. And then afterwards, she became a witness of her own depression, I guess. And that is what she was talking about. And it was a severe depression. For one year, she stayed in Sri Lanka with an aunt. Uh, she had her room. She was staying there in the dark, did not go out, just just lying in a bed in the dark, completely completely dysfunction, dysfunctional. And whenever she was leaving the room, uh, she tended to drink a lot and she, she had lost it. She wasn't there anymore. And then eventually she went back to the UK, uh, got back her job. She was a teacher. She, I think she has a PhD. And she did not go back to live in the house her husband and her children had. Uh, she went there to visit a few times. And that's the thing. After that, things stop being clear. She talks about her feelings, her emotions and all of that. And I kept thinking, it's cruel. It's re it, sometimes I feel like I don't have a heart, but I kept thinking, wow, you have to be rich to afford that kind of depression. Because I was thinking that in that tsunami in 2004 that killed so many people, she probably wasn't the only woman who lost her husband and her children. She probably wasn't the only person who lost basically their entire family. But she was probably the only person in that situation who could afford, one, to do nothing for an entire year, and two, when going back to her native country, to leave the house empty and live somewhere else. Who else could have afforded that? If you live in a rental, you have to continue to pay the rent and you have you have to go back to the place where you live. And I was a bit heartless like that. I just could not understand the context because she gave so little information about the context. Uh, not once does she mention therapy, does she mention medication? How did she get out of that depression? What did she try to do to get out of it? I don't know because there's no references to anything outside of herself. It's really a memoir about her own feelings and not the feelings in relation with the outside world, just her feelings related to herself. And that's not something that I enjoy. That's the type, not that there's nothing to learn about this, but for me, that's the type of information I would look for in a nonfiction book. Uh, in a fictional character, that is exactly the type of thing that you can learn, that you can, you learn how to empathize with people in tough situations and in difficult situations. And the novelist can arrange things to make it, to make it, uh, well, more interesting, I guess. Uh, but in the case of Wave, that, that's the thing that bothered me. It lacked objective information that could be helpful to somebody who is in a depression or somebody wanting some information about, okay, you were in this horrible situation. How did you get out of it? There's not a single information about that. So that's where the nonfiction quality of it goes a little bit away because I turn to nonfiction to learn stuff. Uh, it, not everything needs to be a guidebook. Not everything needs to be a teaching manual. It doesn't have to be that, but there has to be some sort of information that is more than just feelings. And in the second part of that book of Wave, we had just that. Um, in the three other books, um, of the three other books, I would say that the other one that was closest to that was uh, Touching My Father's Soul. Uh, this search for faith was very personal. But at the same time, he was not just talking about his personal faith. He was talking also about how it works, the temples, and the, the fact of having one foot in one um, 
one foot in the Western culture and one foot in the Eastern culture and how to reconcile that. So it was not just his own feelings. He could look to the outside, like what's Western culture and what's Eastern culture and how do they clash and what makes it difficult? Uh, what makes the relation between Sherpas and Western uh, climbers difficult on the Everest? Um, and things like that. It, it was not just his thoughts. It was also in relation with the outside. Um, so... Yeah, and the others were clearly about something else. Um, in the uh, Garlic and Sapphire, the, the food memoir, uh, the food was the best part because that's what had nothing to do with the author. <laughs> um, the, the characters, they were interesting, but at the same time, the, the real star of that book is the food, and that food has nothing to do with the author. It's something that exists out there. Um, in Alice Robb's Don't Think, uh, Don't Think Dear, um, she talks not just about herself, she talks about uh, Balanchine uh, and how that, that's the founder of the School of American Ballet. He's a choreographer, he was from Russia, and he worked with the uh, uh, Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. Um, and he was, he was more or less a dictator. He invent, not that he, he invented it, but he required absolute obedience from his dancers and more than some others. Um, and Rob explores how this sort of toxic relation can affect someone who spends their formative years in that environment. Uh, when you are 12, 13, 14 years old, and what you learn is complete total obedience. Um, she also talks about um, um, eating disorders, uh, because of course there's a lot of anorexia in ballerina. She talks about a scene that she witnessed and that should have shocked her, but did not. And it was two girls who were sharing, they were cutting into one M&M. &M. Uh, and they were cheating, they were feeling very naughty for eating half of one M&M. &M. Um, that, that, that's, that's kind of striking. Um, and she, she talks about the experience of other ballerinas like uh, uh, Misty Copeland, uh, or um, I forgot the names of the others, uh, but she, she doesn't just talk about herself, she talks about other people's experience too. So it was not just a memoir turned toward herself, but it was turned toward the experience toward of being a ballerina or wanting to be a ballerina, uh, towards the world of ballerina, of ballet, and how it translates to an ordinary world. And yeah, th that, that's really the crux for me. Memoirs that are entirely turned towards the person, what they think, what they feel, what they do, and without any reference to the outside world of saying, okay, here's me in this context. They, they, they have to place themselves in a much bigger context. If it's just me, 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 I don't like these memoirs. And Sadly, I'm going to say that, sadly, there are tons and tons and tons of those on the market. The memoirs that are just about one person looking inside, like, like that person is an island and the rest does not exist. Um, it's, it, it's not, an island doesn't float. It, it's fixed somewhere and the sea around is important. It's not an entire universe. You're not just your own little planet turning on yourself and it, it doesn't work. I, I don't like them. And there are tons of those. Um, Again, it may sound cruel, but memoirs of growing up, memoirs of divorce, memoirs of grief, uh, memoirs of overcoming addiction, uh, memoirs of very personal experiences can easily become these little me, me, me memoirs that for me are not interesting. Uh, I assume if they exist, if there are so many of them on the market, it's because I'm the exception. I, I assume a lot of people read them, otherwise they would not be published. So it's probably something, it's probably, it is, it is something that is with me, that's my personal experience. Me, me, me. <laughs> I don't like the memoirs that are turned towards the person too much. So that, that's the thing. And the second thing, of course, uh, the, the memoirs that I like that are turned towards the outside, I have to be interested in what the outside is. So a memoir about ballet, if I was not interested about ballet, I wouldn't care about that book. So um, I have to be interested also in what, in the, the, in the wider picture that is depicted. So not, not just the little person, I have to be interested in the background picture or what is being depicted too. So that was my experience. That was that's the conclusion of uh, my little experiment. That 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 uh, 
that was made on a much smaller sample that I was hoping for. Um, but I think I I also include in that memoirs that I've read before, and I think that's the um, that that's the crux of the thing. The memoir has to be about more than just the person. So that's it. That, that's my wrap up for People April. So I, I want to say again, thank you to everyone who participated in People April. And let me know in the comments if you've participated in what you read, if you liked it. Uh, if you have ideas for next year, let me know. Uh, we could incorporate some things. Uh, we, we wanted to do a tag, Ros and me, and we sort of forgot. <laughs> uh, forgot or did not have the time, probably uh, is more like it. Uh, I forgot for the first week, for the first two weeks, and then I remembered, and then I got COVID. So, um, yeah. <laughs> So that was that. Um, and uh, yeah, let me know in the comments uh, about memoirs. Are you like me or do you like the memoirs that are towards, towards the person or do you prefer the ones that are towards other people or do you hate memoir? Do you love memoirs? Or let me know anything you want to tell me about memoirs. <laughs> and I will see you in the next video. À la